Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, I have come with the fourth lecture on the course ADR and arbitration. If you recall in first three lectures, we understood about the basics of ADR. We tried to trace the history of law of arbitration in India, starting from regulations to the 1996 act and the two amendments I mentioned, 2015 amendment and 2019 amendment. In the last lecture, I was talking about the meaning of arbitration, various kinds of arbitration. We classified into ad hoc arbitration, institutional arbitration, domestic arbitration, international commercial arbitration. We also defined the term award, although we saw that Arbitration Conciliation Act does not give us a very comprehensive kind of definition of, of the words arbitration and award, but still we tried to define it. Uh, award was defined, various kinds of awards was also discussed in the last class. I also mentioned that uh, the stepping stone of this act is arbitration agreement. So therefore, there can be arbitration only when there is an arbitration agreement between the parties. And I also mentioned that if there is an arbitration agreement, you are bound to go for arbitration. These are some of the issues which we will discuss in in, in, in uh, lecture number four and lecture number five. So we'll start with the fourth lecture. This is arbitration agreement, the first lecture on arbitration agreement. And after completing this session, you will be in a position to understand what does arbitration agreement mean? What are the ingredients of a valid arbitration agreement? And how an arbitration agreement is different from any other agreement for expert determination. So this is the agenda for this lecture. And let's see what is an arbitration agreement. I have already mentioned some of the things like arbitration agreement is an agreement to arbitrate disputes. We'll talk about it in a bit detail now. Keep in mind the meaning of international commercial arbitration and domestic arbitration. Now, arbitration agreement finds its definition, its meaning in section 7 of the Act. Section 7 has got five subsections. Section 7, subsection 1 says, arbitration is an agreement by the parties to arbitrate. It is an agreement between the parties to arbitrate. What? To arbitrate disputes which have arisen or disputes which may arise. So you can enter into an arbitration agreement to resolve present disputes as well as future disputes. Those disputes must arise out of defined legal relationship between the parties and the defined legal relationship between the parties can be contractual, can be otherwise. It is not necessary that the relationship is based on the contract. So any agreement between the parties to arbitrate present or future disputes which may arise out of defined legal relationship between the parties, this legal relationship can be contractual, can be otherwise and it includes a submission agreement. What do you mean by submission agreement? When I am entering into an agreement, we don't have, usually we don't have a dispute right now. In the course of performance of contract, some dispute may come into existence. Now, those disputes will not automatically be referred to the tribunal. There has to be an act of referring the dispute to arbitration. This actual act of referring the matter to arbitration may be called a submission agreement. So, therefore, every arbitration agreement will have submission agreement as part of it. This is what you have in section 7, subsection 1 agreement between the parties to arbitrate present or future disputes, disputes which arise out of defined legal relationship. This defined legal relationship can be contractual, can be otherwise 
and there must be a submission agreement, submission to arbitrate. Now, as I said, the arbitration agreement is the stepping stone to arbitration. It means you cannot have arbitration for your dispute unless you have an already existing arbitration agreement in place. This uh, created some problem in relation to section 89 of CPC. If you recall, we discussed in our previous lectures. Section 89 of CPC talks about court induced ADR. And I have already explained it that it says that at any point of time, if the presiding officer of the, of, of, of the court is of the view that there exists element of settlement between the parties, then he will formulate the terms of settlement and refer the parties for one of the modes of dispute resolution mentioned in section 89 itself. There are four modes we, we already know. The first mode is arbitration, second is conciliation, then mediation, then lok adalat. Section 89 says, if the matter is referred by the court for arbitration, it shall be done according to Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996. Now, this issue was raised in the case of Salem Bar Advocates Association before the Supreme Court. Salem Bar Advocates Association before the Supreme Court. That how can Section 89 take parties to Arbitration Conciliation Act? in a situation where parties do not have an already existing arbitration agreement. Because as I just said, arbitration agreement is the stepping stone. So unless you have an agreement, how can you start arbitration? So the problem was, in the absence of an arbitration agreement between the parties, can the court in section 89 refer parties to arbitration to be done according to Arbitration Conciliation Act? And court explained the position that 7 is the stepping stone, that is true, but that is a case of voluntary arbitration. In case of court annexed arbitration or court induced arbitration, section 89 is also one of the stepping stones for arbitration. That is how the problem was resolved by the court. So, therefore, voluntary arbitration, for consensual voluntary arbitration, section 7 is the stepping stone. And there cannot be an arbitration unless there is an arbitration agreement. But for the purpose of court-induced arbitration, yes, section 89 of CPC is also one of the stepping stones. Through 89 of CPC, you can also come to the Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996. The second important point to understand here is, arbitration agreement may be in the form of a separate agreement or it may be part of the main contract itself. Main contract means, why do we have an arbitration clause? Essentially, there is a contract between you and me. We have entered into a contract to, to, to say some, sell something. I want to sell something to you or I want to perform something for you. And as part of that main contract, we insert a clause that in case any dispute arises of the, out of this contract, the same shall be referred for arbitration to be done according to this particular method, whatever. So, what I am saying, an arbitration agreement can be in the form of a clause in the main contract itself or it can be there in the form of a separate agreement. Instead of writing as part of the main contract, we can have a separate agreement that any dispute arising out of contract between A and B, contract number this, entered on this date, any dispute arising out of that contract shall be resolved by way of arbitration to be done according to this agreement. So, it can be part of the main contract as a clause, it can be in the form of a separate agreement. Now, what is important here is whether it is part of the main contract or whether it is there in the form of a separate agreement, it remains a distinct document. So, arbitration agreement remains a distinct document and termination of main contract will not automatically mean termination of the arbitration clause. Even if it is part of the main contract, it has it its independent existence. So, if court terminates the main contract, it will have no effect on the arbitration clause which is there as part of the main contract. That is what I am saying that arbitration agreement has separate independent existence even if it is there in the main contract as part of the main contract. Another important point is to understand the difference between an arbitration agreement and any other agreement for that matter. You cannot assure performance of that contract. There can always be a possibility of breach of any contract. 
Now, what you can claim, if there is breach of contract, what you can claim? You can claim remedy in the form of damages. So, you and me enter into a contract for performance. I am insisting you are not performing. It is a case of breach of contract. I cannot insist that you must definitely perform. I can claim damages. So, in any other contract, that contract cannot be specifically enforced. Whereas, arbitration agreement can be specifically enforced. What do I mean by that? There is a clause that in case a dispute arises, we will refer the matter for arbitration. How can you breach this contract? How can you breach this agreement? You can breach this agreement when there is a dispute. Instead of going for arbitration, you go to a court. That is how you can breach an arbitration clause. Now, if you go to court, maybe after a few lectures, we will understand that when you go to court and commit breach of arbitration clause, it is a duty on the court to send you back for arbitration. So, there is no need to claim damages or something like that. Arbitration clause can be specifically enforced. This is the most fundamental difference between an arbitration agreement and any other contract. Any other contract cannot be specifically enforced, but arbitration agreement can be specifically enforced because if you commit breach and go to a court, court is under a duty to send you back for arbitration. These are some basic understanding about arbitration agreement. Section 7 further says, it does not provide any format of an arbitration agreement, but it says that arbitration agreement must be in writing. It also explains the meaning of the word writing. When can you say that arbitration agreement is in writing? There are three points there. Point number one, it is said to be in writing. If it is in the form of a document, it must be signed by the parties. Second, even if it is not there in the form of one document, it can still be considered as a written arbitration agreement if it is there in the form of correspondence between the parties. There is email exchange and on the basis of email exchange, you can make out that parties have entered into an arbitration agreement. But the condition is, if it is not there in the form of a document, it has come into existence on the basis of exchange of documents or communication or correspondence, then in that case, you must have a permanent record of that correspondence. Only then you can say, that a written arbitration agreement has come into existence. And the third is, it can also arise out of claim and defense statement. I claim that let's there be arbitration. You accept the claim that let, let there be arbitration. So, it can arise out of claim and defense statement. It may emerge at the stage of trial. During the trial, one party may propose arbitration, the other party may accept and the court may send them for arbitration. So, it can arise out of claim and defense statement also. So, arbitration agreement has to be in writing. It is in writing if one of these three conditions is, is, is fulfilled. If it is in the form of a document, it must be signed by the parties. Second, it can be there in the form of correspondence between the parties. The condition is the, that you must have a permanent record of that correspondence. Then only we can say that the agreement is in writing. Third, it can arise out of claim and defense statements. There are few words which I used. It is an agreement to arbitrate, a dispute, present, future, arising out of defined legal relationship, whether contractual or otherwise. We have used all these words for the purpose of defining international commercial arbitration as it is given in section 21F of the Act, if you remember. 1940 Act did not use the word dispute. It uses the word difference in place of dispute. Not much difference. Difference can be slightly broader as compared to dispute. We understand the meaning of dispute. In fact, we started the first lecture with, with the meaning of dispute as, as to what is conflict. What do you mean by a dispute? It is a state of hostility between the parties. That phrase defined legal relationship. Any dispute arising out of defined legal relationship. This phrase defined legal relationship has not been defined. It has been borrowed from ancestral model law and has not been defined. Next point is, this defined relationship may arise out of contract. It can be contractual or otherwise. I have already explained while discussing international commercial arbitration that 
the relationship can be based on contract the relationship between parties can be based on statute and i have also mentioned that this arbitration agreement can be there as part of the main contract can be there as as a separate agreement whatever is the case it has its independent existence and termination of main contract will not automatically terminate the arbitration agreement there are some ingredients of arbitration agreement you can see there is a case bihar state mineral development corporation and another versus encon builders private limited 2003 judgment of supreme court bihar state mineral development corporation and another versus encon builders where court has identified few ingredients of a valid arbitration agreement there must be a present or future difference between the parties second there must be the intention of the parties to settle such differences by a private tribunal the intention of the parties to settle the dispute or differences by a private tribunal must be very clear must be manifest third the parties must agree in writing to be bound by the decision of such tribunal the arbitration clause must clearly mention that parties shall be bound by the decision of the tribunal the decision of tribunal shall be final and binding it should be there in the arbitration clause and the parties must be ad idem parties must be ad idem means there is meeting of minds of the parties both the parties are thinking about the same thing in the same manner so that is meeting of minds so therefore both the parties are giving their consent to the same thing in the same way these are some very important ingredients of a valid arbitration agreement there must be a dispute present or future two there must be intention on the part of the parties which must be manifest there must be intention on the part of the parties that they want to settle their dispute or difference by a private tribunal arbitral tribunal third they must agree in writing that they they will be bound by the decision of that tribunal and fourth the parties must be ad idem they must give their consent thinking about same thing in the same manner there are other cases also where court where the supreme court has laid down certain features of arbitration agreement for example in jagdish chandar versus ramesh chandar and others the supreme court identified few points which are essential ingredients of a valid arbitration agreement for example the first one is the intention of the parties to enter into an arbitration agreement shall have to be gathered from the terms of the agreement how do we understand whether the document which we have in our hand is an arbitration agreement or not whether it is a valid agreement or not to understand whether it is a valid agreement or not court says you will have to find out the intention of the parties what parties must have intended at the time when they entered into the contract did they intend to enter into an arbitration agreement and how will you find it out you will have to gather the intention of the parties from the terms of the agreement then second point is words used should disclose a determination and obligation to go to arbitration and not merely contemplate the possibility of going for arbitration so if parties must have intended to enter into an arbitration agreement point number 1 2 look at the agreement to see whether words disclose a determination to go for arbitration or whether the words disclose a possibility to go for arbitration if we have written that in case a dispute arises we will explore the possibility of mediation first and if mediation fails then we may plan to go for arbitration now this is not a clear determination to go for arbitration it is subject to the condition that first mediation fails and then we will plan or we will decide whether we should go for arbitration so this is only a possibility a probability it is not a clear determination a clear obligation on the parties to go for arbitration in case a dispute arises such a clause is not valid arbitration clause so the parties must clearly intend to enter into an arbitration agreement there must be clear determination on the part of parties to refer the matter for arbitration look at the words to see whether parties have clearly identified the obligation on them 
or is it a case of mere possibility? Third point, Koch says, there may be a clause which does not use the word arbitration, arbitral tribunal. That clause can still be an arbitration agreement if it has all the attributes of an arbitration agreement. There may be a clause which does not use these words at all. In case of any dispute, the same shall be referred for resolution to Mr. X who will do it according to Arbitration Conciliation Act. Now, it does not use the word arbitration. That it does not use the word arbitral tribunal. It can still be a valid arbitration agreement if it has all the attributes of an arbitration agreement. What are the attributes? We have already identified. It has to be in writing. There must be a dispute. Uh, there must be intention on the parties to arbitrate. There, it is not sufficient if the words indicate a possibility. So, these are the attributes. Parties must be ad item. They must agree in writing that they shall be bound by the decision of the tribunal. If these features, if these attributes are there, only because the words arbitration, arbitral tribunal have not been used, will not make it something other than arbitration agreement. The converse of this point is, even if you use the word arbitration, arbitral tribunal, still it may be something other than arbitration agreement. What I am trying to say, use of words are not conclusive. These are only indicative. I may write that the document which you and me are entering is a lease document, is a lease document, is a lease document at 10 places. But on interpretation of document, it may emerge that parties never wanted to create a lease relationship. They wanted to create a license document. But in order to, to, to hide the real intention, the word lease has been used 10 times in the document. That will not change the nature of the document. Intention of the parties has to be gathered on the basis of interpretation of that document. And how will you gather the intention? The only method is to interpret the document. And the use of words is not the only thing we are going to see. The circumstances will also play some role. Circumstances in which the agreement was done. What parties must have intended is to be identified. So, I may write that this is an arbitration clause, this is an arbitration clause, the body which is going to decide is an arbitral tribunal, but other attributes are missing. Parties never intended to enter into an arbitration agreement. Other attributes are missing. It cannot be an arbitration agreement. So, words are indicative. Words are not conclusive. So, ingredients are clear now. We understand what is an arbitration agreement. There are some ingredients mentioned in section 7. I said writing, when do you say that the agreement is in writing, what are the conditions we understood. In addition to that, we saw two cases where some other grounds have been explained. Recently in 2022, in a case called Baban Rao Rajaram Pund versus Messrs. Samarth Builders and another, there was a matter before the Supreme Court that there is an arbitration clause which does not say, which does not mention that the decision of arbitral tribunal shall be final and binding on the parties. If you go back to the previous slide, one of the essentials in the first case, if you see Bihar State Mineral Development Corporation and another versus Encon Builders, in this first case, the third point, the parties must agree in writing to be bound by the decision of such tribunal. There must be a written statement that we shall be bound by the decision, the decision shall be final. This is one of the essential ingredients of arbitration agreement. Now, this was missing in the case of Baban Rao Rajaram Pund. This statement was missing and the matter goes to Supreme Court that this is not a valid arbitration agreement because parties do not bind themselves in writing by the decision of arbitral tribunal. This is one of the essential ingredients. It is missing. Therefore, the agreement in question is not a valid arbitration agreement. Now, court says that this statement may be missing, but do not just see that it is missing. Read the entire clause. The clause says that the matter shall be referred for arbitration to be done according to Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996. If you look into Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996, Section 35 attaches finality to an arbitral award. So, any award passed according to this Act 
will definitely be final and binding. So even if I don't write in it in my arbitration clause, by the fact that I am doing my, my arbitration according to Arbitration Conciliation Act, that in itself says that I am accepting that the decision shall be final and binding on me. So therefore, court says that the responsibility of the court is not to adopt a very technical approach while interpreting the arbitration clause. Courts have to take pragmatic approach. Therefore, there may be situations when you come across certain arbitration clauses which appear to be unworkable because certain words are missing. But it is the responsibility of the court to make those clauses workable. Yes, within permissible limits of law, you have to make it workable. There may be deficiency of words in the agreement. But despite those deficiency of words, if the intention of the parties otherwise is very clear that they wanted to refer the matter to arbitration to be done according to this act, and if the intention is also clear that they wanted the decision to be final and binding by the fact that they are referring to Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996, then things are clear and let's not be very technical in our approach and declare the agreement to be invalid merely on the ground that these words have not been used. So what I am trying to say is that courts will now be very liberal in interpreting your arbitration agreement. And simply because few words have been used, it becomes an arbitration clause? No. Simply few words are missing, it, it does not remain a valid arbitration agreement? No. Court will adopt a pragmatic approach. And even if it finds a clause which seems to be unworkable, it is the duty of the court within permissible limits of law, of course, to make that unworkable law a workable law, to make an unworkable clause a workable clause. These are the ingredients of a valid arbitration agreement. Now, if we understand what is an arbitration agreement, now let us now understand the difference between arbitration agreement and an agreement for expert determination. What do I mean by that? If you look at the slide, there is a chart made. Tribunals can be of two kinds. One, parties by consent will create the tribunal. And other kind of tribunal is one which already exists. Which already exists means which have been created under statute. For example, in administrative law, you must have studied Administrative Tribunal Act 1985, which establishes Central Administrative Tribunal. So there are many tribunals which are existing, which have been established by the statute. Now, out of these two, we are talking about tribunals which are based on consent of the parties, the private tribunals. We are talking about tribunals which are based on consent of the parties. We are not talking about tribunals created under statute. Now, the tribunals which are based on consent of the parties can again be of two kinds. Those tribunals which passes non-enforceable orders and those tribunals which passes enforceable orders. So, tribunal which is based on consent of the parties is our subject matter. But even such tribunals can be of two kinds. Those which pass non-enforceable orders, those which pass enforceable orders. Those which pass non-enforceable orders, an example can be All India Muslim Personal Law Board, for example. All India Muslim Personal Law Board is doing service by resolving issues related to a particular community, but it does not pass enforceable orders, enfor orders which are enforceable under law. Now, we are not talking about those consent-based tribunals which pass non-enforceable orders. Our subject matter is those consent-based tribunals which pass enforceable orders. And such tribunals can again be of two kinds. Tribunals which are obliged to act in a ministerial manner and tribunals which are obliged to act in a judicial manner. So what I am saying, there is a tribunal which is based on consent of the parties and that tribunal will pass enforceable orders. Such tribunals can be of two kinds. One is which acts in judicial manner and the other is which acts in ministerial manner. Ministerial manner, acting in ministerial manner means acting on the basis of discretion, acting on the basis of my expertise. What is the value of this object? I am a valuer, I will tell you it, it, it is of rupees 10. 
what is the value of my second hand car a valuer will come look at the model look at the condition of that car and will finally say the car is of worth rupees x so he is deciding on the basis of his expertise his discretion this is acting in a ministerial manner example is a valuer on the other hand we have a tribunal which is based on consent of the parties which is going to pass enforceable orders on the basis of acting in a judicial manner acting in a judicial manner means that the neutral third party the judge the person is not acting on the basis of his expertise he is acting on the basis of submission made by the parties the evidence is presented by the parties the witness is presented by the parties so acting judicially means acting on submissions by the parties it is this kind of tribunal which is our subject matter the tribunal which is based on consent of the parties which passes enforceable order acting in a judicial manner this actually is the subject matter of our discussion and what i am trying to say is why we have made this chart there is always a possibility of confusion between the last two things whether it is a tribunal which is an arbitral tribunal or whether it is a tribunal which is a tribunal for expert advice whether the agreement in question is an arbitration agreement or whether the agreement in question is an agreement for expert advice or expert determination these two may come very close to each other and there may be a situation of confusion how to distinguish the two is what we'll discuss now in the case of kk modi versus kn modi and others eir 1998 1297 the facts of this case was very simple there is a business family and there was some problem in that business family and partition was to be done they got divided in two groups various financial institutions intervened in the process and some settlement was finally done there is a memorandum of understanding which was signed by both the parties party a had few members party b had few members of the family now that mou broadly says that there are, there are two schedules in mou the first schedule has list of companies which will go to one group the second schedule has list of companies which will go to other group that was agreed there were three companies which were not listed in either of these two groups these three companies had to be split and will go to different groups and the assets will be divided in some ratio identified to be 60 to 40 ratio but how to divide the assets in 60 to 40 ratio for that you will have to value the assets now there are two things one is for splitting of three companies there is a professional body appointed to propose the plan for splitting of three companies and for valuation of assets there was a professional valuer who was appointed to propose the the valuation this mou was signed by both the parties there is a clause in that mou clause 9 which says that implementation will be done in consultation with the financial institutions for all disputes clarifications etc in respect of implementation of this agreement the same shall be referred to the chairman ifci or his nominees whose decision will be final and binding on both the groups this clause was in question whether this clause is an arbitration agreement or whether this clause is an agreement for expert determination the clause says that implementation of this mou shall be done in consultation with financial institution in case of any uh, any dispute or clarification the same shall be referred to the chairman of ifci or his nominees whose decision shall be final and binding on both the groups this is what this clause 9 says now when the process of implementation of mou started both the parties had objection on the report prepared by the company which was given the job to propose splitting of three companies both the groups had objections both the groups of modi family had objection on the valuation done by the valuer and therefore matter was referred to the chairman of ifci chairman ifci appoints a committee to help him 
he raises issues to be solved and finally gives his decision now this decision whether this decision is an award or it is a decision something other than award whether the decision is award or not that depends on another question whether the agreement in question the, the the clause 9 of mou is an arbitration agreement or something else now what court says court gives you few more points to understand what is an arbitration agreement i will quickly rush through these six points and then we'll see whether clause 9 is an arbitration clause or something else we have already understood what is there in section 7 of arbitration conciliation act we have already understood the cases which tell us the ingredients of a valid arbitration agreement we understand the subject matter of our law it is that tribunal which is based on consent of the parties to pass enforceable orders acting in a judicial manner this is my subject matter whether chairman ifci is an arbitral tribunal whether the decision of chairman ifci is an arbitral award it all depends whether clause 9 of mou is an arbitration agreement these are the six points the first is the arbitration agreement must contemplate that the decision of the tribunal will be binding on the parties to the agreement we already know about it that the agreement must clearly contemplate that the decision of the tribunal shall be binding second that the jurisdiction of the tribunal to decide the rights of the parties must derive either from the consent of the parties or from an order of the court or from a statute the terms of which make it clear that the process is to be an arbitration what court says the tribunal gets jurisdiction from where it should get jurisdiction either from the consent of the parties it can get jurisdiction from a court court induced arbitration section 89 cpc or it can get jurisdiction from some statute there may be a labor legislation which refers some labor dispute for arbitration it is possible there may be some uh, commercial law which refers matter for for arbitration so a tribunal will get jurisdiction either from the consent of the parties or from an order of a court or from a statute but it must clearly establish lay down that the process is going to be arbitration so apart from other essential ingredients the first ingredient here in kk modi is that the parties must contemplate that the decision shall be binding second the source of reference the jurisdiction of the tribunal is coming from the consent of the parties or order of a court or by through a statute third the agreement must contemplate or the parties must contemplate that substantive rights of parties will be determined by the agreed tribunal the agreement must clearly contemplate that the tribunal is going to decide substantive rights of the parties not just procedural decisions have to be taken no we must contemplate that the tribunal agreed upon tribunal shall decide substantive rights fourth that the tribunal will determine the rights of the parties in an impartial and judicial manner with the tribunal owing an equal obligation of fairness towards both sides the agreement must clearly contemplate that while determining the substantive rights of the parties the tribunal shall remain objective tribunal shall remain impartial and tribunal shall act in a judicial manner meaning thereby tribunal shall decide on the basis of submission made by the parties fifth point that the judgment of the parties to refer their disputes to the decision of the tribunal must be intended to be enforceable in law so whatever tribunal decides for the parties we accept that this shall be enforceable by law so fifth point is parties contemplate that an enforceable order shall be passed and sixth point the agreement must contemplate that the tribunal will make a decision upon a dispute which is already formulated at the time when a reference is made to the tribunal point number 6 is that tribunal shall take a decision on a formulated dispute now if i quickly summarize whatever i mention in these six points there shall be a binding decision second 
the source of jurisdiction can be consent of the parties order of the court statute third we agree that this tribunal will decide our substantive rights fourth when the tribunal decides our substantive rights it will act in an objective manner impartial manner and it will act in a judicial manner fifth tribunal will pass an order which is enforceable in law and sixth tribunal will decide a dispute which is a formulated dispute which has already been formulated which has already come into existence now this is the background we have understood section 7 we have understood the ingredients of a valid agreement we have read these points we also know what kind of tribunal is our subject matter now how will i decide whether the agreement in question is an arbitration agreement or whether it is an agreement for expert determination that's a question there are few points which you have to keep in mind while determining whether it is an arbitration agreement or whether it is an agreement for expert determination what do we actually do we do an objective inquiry into the intention of the parties as i mentioned in previous slides also we have to do an objective inquiry into the intention of the parties what parties must have intended at the time when they entered into the agreement if you recall i was mentioning there is a difference between lease and license take it as an illustration lease creates interest in favor of transferee license does not create any interest in favor of transferee so if i am the landlord and i want to give my premises to you on on rent basis i will prefer to call that document as license deed because license does not create any interest in your favor and if it is not creation of interest it can be revoked at any time but whereas lease cannot be revoked that easily so although i am entering into a lease deed i am trying to camouflage things by using words like license license p licensor licensee when this document will come before the court court has to understand the true nature of this document and in order to understand the true nature of this document court will have to conduct as i said an objective inquiry into the intention of the parties what parties must have intended at the time when they entered into this document when they signed this document whether there was lease in their mind or whether there was license in their mind so there are few factors for example first use of words like arbitration and tribunal as i have already mentioned use of words like arbitration and tribunal are not conclusive these are only indicative i have already mentioned this point and the converse also even if the clause may not use words like arbitration and arbitral tribunal it can still be an arbitration agreement so therefore use of words is only indicative it is not conclusive second point one has to see if there is an issue to be tried if you go back to the six points given by the supreme court in kk modi point number 6 if i go back to the previous slide point number 6 the agreement must contemplate that tribunal will make a decision upon a dispute which is already formulated at the time when a reference is made to the tribunal you are talking about formulated dispute one has to see whether there is a dispute one has to see whether there is an issue good for trial what do we mean by issue if you remember in first lecture i said a dispute means where parties hold a definite stand on an issue there is a lis lis if parties hold definite stand on an issue in case definite positions are taken it amounts to formulated dispute and in a situation where no definite stands are taken it is not a case of formulated dispute so what are we referring to is it a matter on which parties have taken definite stand yes then in that case we are referring a dispute to the tribunal if you are referring a dispute to the tribunal it means it is an arbitral tribunal it means the agreement in question is an arbitration agreement so first use of words is only indicative it is not conclusive second you have to see whether there is an issue to be tried 
issue as i said where parties hold definite positions definite stand on a particular thing if we are referring a dispute it means the body in question is an arbitral tribunal and the agreement in question is an arbitration agreement the third you have to read the agreement to understand whether agreement puts an obligation on the tribunal to act in a judicial manner or not if the answer is yes it obliges the tribunal to act in a judicial manner then such clause can be called as an arbitration agreement but one any one of these terms will not be sufficient to call it an arbitration agreement the cumulative effect of all these tests will help us to finally decide whether the document in question is an arbitration agreement or anything other than that so use of words second see whether there is a issue to be tried third whether the tribunal is obliged to act in a judicial manner fourth see whether the clause in question is designed to resolve a dispute or whether it has been designed to avoid a dispute from emerging what does the clause in question provide for i gave this simple example if i think that the object a particular object is of some value and there are two parties one says it is 5 rupees the other says it is 10 rupees they have definite stand it is a matter which is referred to a body to decide the case but if the first party says probably it is 5 to 10 the other party says i believe it is between 6 to 10 none of the parties are clear there is no issue to be tried it is only a situation which may eventually lead to a conflict gradually parties may start holding positions and there will be a dispute so before dispute emerges we can refer it to a valuer who will tell you the exact value it happens when you propose to sell your second hand car and the other party comes you will say i will take i, I require 1 lakh rupees the other party will say no it is not more than 50000 rupees there is impasse there is conflict there is different positions dispute may arise a wise idea is to refer it to a professional valuer who will value and will say that the car is of worth 75000 rupees nothing more nothing less and a possible dispute is avoided you will have to see the clause you have to see the clause if clause says that the price of the car shall be as decided by the parties however in case of disagreement the same shall be referred to a professional valuer whose decision shall be final this is not a dispute resolution clause this is not an arbitration clause this is a clause to avoid a dispute this is a clause which may be called as an agreement for expert determination so the fourth point which i have mentioned here is to examine the clause and see whether it is designed to resolve a dispute or whether it is designed to avoid a dispute if it is only avoiding disputes it cannot be an arbitration agreement the fifth point is examine if the clause can be invoked by non parties also if the answer is yes it cannot be an arbitration agreement there is a case called as imperial metal industries versus amalgamated union of engineering workers 1979 this is an english case it was mentioned see the the matter was i asked some manufacturer to manufactured goods for me the manufacturer agrees to the offer we entered into a contract one of the conditions of the contract is that the manufacturer on my request has agreed to pay minimum wages to his workmen during the performance of contract so as long as manufacturer is manufacturing my orders he will pay minimum wages to the workmen this was one of the conditions on which i was insisting and he agreed there is a clause which says that in case of any dispute the same shall be referred for arbitration to be done according to this method now as we progressed it was discovered that manufacturer is not paying minimum wages to the workmen now workmen wanted to raise the issue because this amounts to breach of one of the conditions in the contract because one of the conditions is breached so workmen wanted to raise this point and they wanted to invoke that arbitration clause 
they wanted to invoke that dispute resolution clause which said that in case of any dispute arising out of this contract the same shall be referred for arbitration but they were not allowed to invoke it because they were not the parties to the agreement right who were the parties i was the party and the manufacturer was the party a non party was not allowed to invoke the arbitration clause now you will have to see the arbitration clause and decide whether non parties are allowed to invoke it or not if non parties are allowed to invoke it it cannot be an arbitration clause now we apply all these to clause 9 of mou which said that in case of any dispute in case of any dispute i'll go back to clause 9 yes clause 9 of mou it says implementation of this will be done according to implementation of this mou shall be done in consultation with uh, financial institutions for all disputes clarifications the same shall be referred to the chairman ifci whose decision shall be final and binding now whether this is an arbitration agreement or an agreement for expert determination we have to apply the tests the word arbitration is not written here arbitral tribunal is not mentioned but the word dispute is mentioned the word agreement is mentioned final binding these have been mentioned so on the basis of use of words we cannot finally conclude whether it is arbitration agreement or an agreement for expert determination so my first point will not be that useful second see if there is an issue to be tried see if there is any dispute now i believe all the disputes were already solved by the mou because i said all the companies listed in schedule 1 will go to group a all the companies listed in schedule 2 will go to group b so the dispute is already resolved second if you remember i said the three companies had to be split they knew that it had to be split a professional body was asked to do the uh, propose the plan for splitting so there was no dispute essentially third the assets will be divided into 60 is to 40 ratio a valuer was appointed to value the total assets so there was no dispute between the two groups all the disputes have already been resolved by the mou and if there is no dispute what dispute will be referred to the chairman ifci some clarifications may be sought for the purpose of implementation because chairman ifci a financial institution will be in a position to help parties in implementation of this mou the mou solves the dispute so applying the second test we can see that in the instant case there is no issue remains to be tried every issue has already been resolved third you have to see whether the tribunal is obliged to act in a judicial manner now clause 9 nowhere says that the tribunals have to make submission present their arguments so there is no requirement of acting judicially clearly visible in clause 9 of mou so that also goes against the point that it is not an arbitration agreement point number 4 if you see whether the clause has been designed to resolve a dispute or whether it has been designed to avoid a dispute because disputes have already been resolved in order to ensure that no new disputes come into existence in the course of implementation clause 9 has been designed so on the basis of these points it appears that clause 9 is not an arbitration clause further clause 9 says any clarification may be referred to chairman ifci who will refer those clarifications it can be referred by either of the groups group a group b it can be referred by the company which was proposing plan for splitting of the three companies it may be referred by the valuer also so non parties to this mou can also refer the questions to chairman ifci that also proves on the basis of point number 5 which we discussed that it is something other than an arbitration agreement and therefore in the case of kk modi versus kn modi court concluded that this is not an arbitration agreement this is an agreement for expert determination there is another case state of up versus tipper chand this is 1980 supreme court judgment there is a clause in the contract i will read this clause you can yourself decide whether it is an arbitration clause or an agreement for expert determination the clause provided that the decision of the superintending engineer 
shall be final, conclusive and binding on all parties to the contract upon all questions relating to the meaning of the specification, designs, drawings and instructions. This is the clause. Is it an arbitration clause? Court says no. There is no mention of any dispute in this clause. There is no mention of any reference in this clause. There is no mention as to how the superintending engineer is going to perform his duty. It is only an agreement for expert advice where superintending engineer has been empowered, have been allowed to supervise the execution of the work, nothing more than that. So such clauses cannot be an arbitration clause. So what we discuss here in this session is we discuss two important aspects related to arbitration agreement. We understood the essentials of a valid arbitration agreement with the help of certain cases. And we also understood as to how an arbitration agreement can be distinguished from an agreement for expert determination. In the next lecture, we will talk more about section 7. There are a few other aspects of arbitration agreement. We will take up those issues in the next session. Thank you very much for now. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said, but also in what remains unsaid. Today I will be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered. And Indeed, the very charm of this particular story that I am going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends. It is an ancient tale from Mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of Somerset Mom stands out. Uh, the adaptation that I will be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that Mom wrote. The story is titled, in all of its adaptations almost, as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty-handed. Indeed, the servant had all gone wiet, and trembling with fear, he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace. When I entered the market, the servant said to his master, I was jostled by a woman, and when I turned to look at her, I saw that she was death. I am very scared, master, because death looked at me with a threatening gesture. Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death? The master, being a good man, gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death. Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? Asked the master to death. And death replied, It was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today because this evening I have an appointment with him in Samara. See you in the next episode 
of literary snippet.